Welcome. So this is the second half of Chapter 17. Again, we're looking at exchange rate movements and what are the factors driving exchange rate movements. Last time we looked at longer run trend factors in the, in, in the structure of the economy that's going to be driving exchange rates. Here we're going to be looking at short-term economic impacts and how those, can, those things can drive changes in exchange rates. Um, and so this graph sort of sums up the, the intuition behind why we uh, might be interested in this thing, uh, in, in changes in, in exchange rates in the short term. Um, there's significant fluctuations on a day-to-day, -day, even a, uh, a, an hour-to-hour -hour or minute-to-minute -minute basis in terms of exchange rates. So that's one of the things we want to know is what's moving exchange rates in those shorter time periods. In order to do that, we want to understand the market for um, uh, domestic assets. Okay, So that's going to drive our understanding of this basic uh, framework for exchange rate movements. And so in the market for... Uh, domestic denominated assets, there's going to be a supply of assets and a demand for assets. And so that's going to be the tool for which we understand these exchange rate movements. And so the supply of domestic or dollar denominated assets, again, we're thinking about the U.S. as being the domestic economy. Um, if you're in another country, then you just sort of flip it around on its head a little bit. Um, so in terms of thinking about the supply of domestic assets, that's going to be essentially fixed in the near term. So we think about things like real estate, uh, the amount of um, uh, money that is sitting in bank accounts, the uh, amount of equities in equities markets, the value of bonds, the value of commodities, um, the value of all real assets. If we add all of that stuff up in the economy and take a snapshot at any given point in time, those things are going to be fixed, right? Not only are they going to be fixed, they're going to be extremely large. So any fluctuations that occur are going to be minuscule relative to the overall size of the, the value of those things. And so because of that, we think of the, the supply of uh, domestic denominated assets as being fixed. And it's going to be fixed relative to the exchange rate. And uh, in, a, in particular, what that implies then is that's going to imply, as we'll see here in a second, that the supply of the domestic denominated assets is going to be vertical, okay? Now, one thing to, to keep in mind here is there's the, a distinction here which we're making in this model between the, um, the supply of domestic denominated assets and the supply of currency, okay? Some uh, foreign exchange models focus simply on the amount of currency in circulation, and that is a completely different model. Here, because these things, because international trade flows and capital flows are concerned with returns on assets, it's more um, uh, straightforward to think about it in terms of the demand for those types of assets and the way that, that exchange rates play in, in the demand for those assets. So because of that, we're thinking about a broader uh, set of, uh, of assets than just domestic currency. So if we look at the supply of domestic assets, first of all, if we're thinking about the U.S. as being our domestic economy, then we're going to want to understand what the quantity of domestic or dollar denominated assets are. Okay? And we're going to uh, measure that in terms of the price of those assets in uh, other currencies. Okay? So in this case, our benchmark is the, do the amount of euros it, we need in order to buy uh, one unit of these uh, of dollars or these de domestically denominated assets. As I said before, as I motivated this, our supply of domestic denominated assets is going to be perfectly vertical. It's going to be fixed at some particular predetermined level because of the size of all of these things that we're thinking about, the value of real estate, bank accounts, etc. It's large and it's not going to change much relative to any movements in the exchange rate. So for simplicity, we assume that the supply of assets is vertical, it's fixed, and it doesn't change. All set? I would say. Yep. Bear with us. So what about the demand? So we put supply and demand together. That's going to give us our exchange rate. So we need to understand what drives the demand for 
domestic assets. And the easy answer to this is really think about, well, what's the return that I get for holding assets in that um, particular economy? So that's going to be the driving force for thinking about what, uh, what drives demand for holding domestic assets relative to foreign assets. Okay? Um, and so the intuition here uh, behind this, and we'll, we'll see this uh, in a graph here in a minute, is if we think about demand, again, a, a demand schedule, just like a, a supply schedule, is hypothetical. So hypothetically, for instance, if there was a decline in the exchange rate, um, so in other words, if the, the, the exchange rate depreciated, the current exchange rate went down, then what's, what's going to happen with people's desire to hold these um, domestic assets? Well, if the currency depreciates, if the currency depreciates, then it's likely that we're going to have people uh, expecting the currency to appreciate in the future. And as a result of that, people are going to uh, think that the return on investments in the domestic economy is going to increase in the future. And so they're more likely to want to hold uh, uh, domestically denominated assets today. So in other words, when we have this expectation of higher returns on uh, dollar denominated assets, then people are going to want to hold more of those dollar denominated assets. And the, the demand, the quantity demanded is going to go up. Um, and if we think about this, um, this is going to be an inverse relationship. So if the exchange rate, the current exchange rate goes up, then people are going to think it's more likely that the exchange rate is going to fall in the future and they're going to want to hold less. So the punchline here is that this is going to give us a downward sloping uh, demand curve for domestically denominated assets. And so if we look at this again, we're thinking about the quantity of dollar denominated assets. This is our domestic economy. And we're measuring the price of dollars in terms of the number of euros we get uh, per dollar. And so as I said, this demand curve is going to be downward sloping. The intuition, as I mentioned before, if the current exchange rate goes down, then it's more likely in the future that the, the currency is going to appreciate, and therefore people are going to want to hold more domestic denominated assets in, in the uh, um, expectation that will, it will appreciate in the future. And therefore, the quantity of domestic uh, assets demanded is going to rise. So we get this inverse relationship between uh, uh, the current exchange rate and the quantity of, of domestic assets demanded. Okay. So if we look at, uh, if we put these things together, demand and supply, then again, this is going to give us our equilibrium, and this is where our exchange rate comes from. So if you look at uh, the, the demand curve here, uh, maybe I'll use this picture here. You can probably see it better. Um, we have the demand curve um, is downward sloping. The supply curve, as we talked about, was perfectly vertical. And where those two things intersect, that's going to give us our equilibrium exchange rate. And so the typical forces that we think about um, when we're not in equilibrium are going to push us towards that equilibrium exchange rate. If we're at a point like point C, then the demand is going to be greater than supply, so the typical forces are going to uh, impede to raise the exchange rate until we end up back at our equilibrium uh, exchange rate level, point B, and vice versa if we're above our exchange rate there. Okay. Um, so... If we think, um, so as we talked about before, the supply curve is fixed, okay, and it's, we're going to assume that it's not going to move at all. And so what this implies then is that with this equilibrium notion, the demand changes are going to be driving our equilibrium exchange rate. And so that's going to be the thing that's going to allow us to explain exchange rate movements, particularly in the short run, are changes in the demand for domestic assets. And so what this implies then is that only demand changes are going to be moving um, these exchange rates. So um, there's some specific things that we can look at um, that are going to be driving this story, and we'll look very carefully at some examples of this in a moment. But uh, the, the, domestic real ex uh, the domestic real interest rate, for instance, 
Uh, if that changes relative to the foreign real interest rate, that can drive domestic asset demand. Um, likewise, if the foreign real interest rate is changing relative to the domestic real interest rate, that's going to um, affect the demand. And expected future exchange rate movements, that's also going to affect the, the current demand for uh, domestic assets. And so this can be driven by things like uh, political factors, instability in the economy or the government, um, and as, as we'll see later on, it can also be dr driven by expected future inflation. And so it turns out that changes in domestic or foreign real interest rates, there's a couple ways in which that can be channeled. So if we think back to the Fisher equation, again, changes in real variables can driv be driven either by their nominal counterpart or by inflation. So in this case, if we're thinking about real interest rates, then changes in either the domestic or the foreign real rate can be driven either by changes in the nominal interest rate, holding inflation constant, um, or changes in the expected inflation rate, holding the nominal interest rate, uh, nominal exchange rate, or sorry, nominal interest rate uh, constant. So let's look at the, some quick examples here. Um, this is an example of an increase in the domestic real interest rate. And so the basic story here is that if there's an increase in domestic real interest rates, the assets that we hold, they're going to become more valuable. The return on those are going to increase. Because of that, uh, people are going to increase the demand for domestic assets relative to uh, other countries, right? So again, we're thinking about the differential between domestic interest rates and foreign interest rates. So the, the differential gets bigger. People want to hold more domestic assets. That drives the demand for domestic assets up, and you can see pretty easily that the exchange rate is going to rise. So in this case, the amount of euros per dollar goes up, the dollar appreciates. So what that means is that we can buy more European goods in the U.S., and so as a result, imports rise. And the flip side of that is that exports are also going to fall. Um, and so as a result of that, we get a, a, a decrease in the total amount of net exports. And by the way, this could be driven, for instance, by uh, a tightening of monetary policy in the U.S., so if the Fed is raising interest rates rapidly, um, perhaps to combat inflation or something like that, then that can result in a tightening of monetary policy, an increase in real rates, and this process could ensue. Um, likewise, we can look at the uh, foreign interest rates. If we have, say, an increase in foreign real interest rates, then we have the opposite effect. Again, the idea is that uh, having assets in other countries is going to earn, earn a higher return, and so we'd rather have our, our assets parked in those high-return countries uh, relative to the domestic economy. So the demand for uh, assets in other countries goes up. And relatively speaking, the demand in the domestic economy falls for holding domestic assets. So as a result, the demand falls to D2. You can see the exchange rate falls. We get a depreciation of um, the domestic exchange rate. And as a result of that, as we've seen and talked about before, when the domestic currency depreciates, that means that uh, imports are falling, our exports are going to go up, and the net effect between those two is that total net exports is going to rise. This, again, could um, be driven, in this case, as an example, since we're looking at euros per dollar, this could be driven by a tightening of monetary policy by the ECB, for instance, um, relative to the Federal Reserve, and that would drive this type of result here. So we can also look at changes in expected future exchange rates. So this, is, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. The idea is that if we think exchange rates are going to be higher in the future, well, we're going to want to hold more domestic assets today because the return on those domestic assets in the future is going to be higher. So that's going to drive um, demand today in the expectation of future higher returns. And so the demand curve shifts up, the currency appreciates, and we get the typical things that we've seen um, with a currency appreciation. And then lastly, we can look at a change in um, domestic inflation. So in this case here, we have higher expected future inflation. Again, through this Fisher effect, that, that would result in a decline in real interest rates. If domestic real interest rates are falling, then the incentive to hold uh, domestic assets is getting lower. In that case, the demand for domestic de denominated assets goes down. The exchange rate depreciates, and as a result, exports go up, imports go down, and the net effect of those is that net exports increase. 
So one important thing to, to keep in mind here is the, the response in this particular example to changes in inflation and expected inflation in particular really depend crucially on how nominal interest rates change relative to inflation. Because keep in mind, with this Fisher equation, this Fisher effect here, the real rate is driven by both nominal interest rates and expected inflation. Okay. So this gives you an example of why it's important to understand this distinction. For instance, if nominal interest rates increase less than expected inflation, okay, then that's going to result in a decrease in uh, the real interest rate. Right? So nominal rates are going down, but uh, sorry, uh, nominal rates are increasing, but they're not going up by as much as inflation is going up. So overall, the net effect of that Fisher equation says that the real interest rate is going to fall. That would drive down the demand for domestic assets and result in a de depreciation. However, if it's the case that inflation is going up, expected inflation is rising, and nominal interest rates keep pace with that, then this Fisher equation says the real interest rate is going to be unchanged. So holding everything else constant, the demand for domestic assets should be unchanged, and you wouldn't see any effects there. On the, on the other hand, if we have the case where nominal rates are going up faster or more than expected inflation, then the real interest rate actually is going to rise as a result. And when the real interest rate goes up, then that's going to result in an appreciation of domestic assets and an increase in um, the demand for those. So in terms of thinking about the previous example, it's really crucial to understand the distinction between what's happening to nominal interest rates and what's happening to expected inflation in this, in this case here. So the punchline of this is that these are all factors which are going to result in driving the exchange rate in the shorter term, um, but there's also underlying structural and institutional factors in the economy which are also going to be driving longer-term trends in the exchange rate. So when we put all of those things together, that then helps us understand these exchange rate movements. And as we talked about before, exchange rates are important for a variety of reasons. Thank you.